that we have identified. And then I'd like to explain some of the important updates and refinements to the ecclesiastical depot. So let me talk about the will and testament first. The reasons taking time to prepare an example of a will and testament is that there is a background story to will and testament that is as important as the actual document. Now, one of the things that has been consistent in these chats over the weeks and months is that there is no magic bullet when one produces a document. In fact, it is worth recalling what documents and writing is relative to law. All the ancient civilizations, whether it be the Yahudi, who we know as the Israelites or the Celts, and, and indeed the most ancient indigenous cultures, didn't have writing systems. Not, not because they were un, unable to set up a writing system or incapable, but because they regarded documents and writing as an abomination of the law. Why? Because once documents are raised, then form can be risen up as greater than substance. In other words, the procedure becomes the law instead of the law itself. Now, does this sound familiar? This is precisely the system that we're dealing with today with the Roman cult, where they place form and ritual and documents far above the principles of law that drive them to the point of absurdity. Documents, as they were first written, were argued as necessary as a memoriam of auricula, that is, spoken acts of law. And despite their best attempts, they still cannot remove the most ancient principle from the beginning of time that all law is auricula, all law is vocal. In other words, if you can't explain yourself, if you can't stand there and express who you are clearly, what you know clearly, if you cannot demonstrate competence, then there is no document that can save you. These are not my words. This is an understanding of your relationship to the law and to the divine, and heaven is your witness, from the very, very first civilizations. Now, with the advent of the internet, with the advent of computers, it is relatively simple to Google, to search, to look for documents and say, aha, all I need to do is copy and paste and prepare a document. And so this has created the concept of the kind of the remedy gurus, the, the template jockeys, and the kind of moving feast looking for the magic silver bullet document. But if you look at the context of what we're saying, the history of law, where all law is and has always been spoken first, then knowing this knowledge and knowing the background of wills and testaments and knowing the context is fundamental. So what is the background of will and testament? Well, despite the misinformation, the first time wills were invented, the very first time, was as recent as 1540 under King Henry VIII of England and his Venetian Magyar advisors in the Statute of Wills. Prior to that time, there was no such thing as a will. No, didn't exist. Now, some might say, hold on a second. The Romans were distributing estates well before 1540 and, and there was estates being distributed well before 1540. And in fact, we've even described papal bulls that defined 
huge claim to states. That's not what I'm saying. The concept of a will, the concept that they want us to not focus on is this concept that on death, a document stands as our auricular testimony in our absence to define our will and intent. The deferral of our auricular intent, our testament. That somehow a document can usurp the spoken word. This is a fiction, an artifice, a concept without any provenance prior to 1540. Instead, prior to 1540, <coughs> the way in which property was apportioned to the heirs was by a formal ritual whereby the testator would call some religious figure, would call witnesses to a holy place and would speak their intent, speak their will. And in an act of succession and testimony would testify to whom their property would be bestowed and the benefits and conditions therein. And that was called a testament. And it was inter vivos. It was done when one was alive. And that is how property was inherited. An act of succession by testament, auricular, whilst living before the particular man or woman died. And all that changed in 1540 to begin with, with the common folk. In fact, the nobles didn't change their concept of inter vivos, auricular testament until much, much later. In fact, until the 19th century, they didn't change it. Which is why in 1837, when the statute of wills was finally abolished, along with a good dozen other statutes of law, in the Wills Act, the new concept of a will and a testament was created. And if you go and look at Blacks or a number of these dictionaries, these dictionaries that are constantly being changed and definitions constantly being changed and things being hidden, that there's no resemblance to the truth nor history so that the judges, the magistrates, the lawyers that read these things have no idea about the law, are wholly stupid and ignorant, unfortunately you will find the absurdity where they claim that the word testament originates not from an ancient ritual of inheritance, but as a claim for the personal property, with will being the real estate. Complete and utter rubbish. And the, the editors of Black should be ashamed of creating such terrible fictions. The concept dating back, in fact, to the Roman, the Roman, pagan Roman system even formalized the number of witnesses that needed to be there for an inter vivos testament. They had the number seven. You needed seven witnesses for an inter vivos, a living auricular testament before it would be valid. So these things are important to understand. These... This background information is important for us to recognise, not the least of which is the uh, form that they present. Now, another thing that they did in the change in statutes is that they defined certain wills that were null and void and they defined certain wills that were subject to statute. In 1937, they said that wills produced by military and seamen were excluded from the act. It was only land creatures that were subject to this. Another thing that they do in wills is that they claim that wills 
represent the irrevocable ancient right for us to determine our heirs and successors and the distribution and administration of our estate and in the same breath say that the distribution of property is not a right but a privilege. Their laws contradict themselves. The laws on wills contradict themselves inherently which is another reason to be cautious moving forward. Now, there are certain technologies of words and certain presentations of wills that appear to be fundamental. The fact that animals test testament, the fact that we have the intent to place a will, the fact that we gift, grant and convey in the terms of a deed as we describe the fact that we nominate a general executor, the fact that we define the rules of administration of the estate, we define the beneficiaries and the conditions of benefices are all fundamental parts of a will. Now over the next week and a half as we refine this there will be a new section on each of these court sites for will and testament. And I ask, please, for your patience, and if you do have feedback and you do have research, then I welcome that. This is an open source, and I know that many of you have enormous experience that can aid and assist in this, and I welcome if you can share that, please, by all means. But the end result, we wish to have appropriate templates, and we wish to have the right background so that we are both competent and in the execution of the templates, they are optimal. Now, talking about ecclesiastical deeds and talking about will and testament, these things are not contradictory, these are complementary. And let me explain by what I mean by complementary. The work on will and testament is to achieve a number of specific objectives. The first is, is there any remedy in their system? We've spoken about this quite, quite often in these calls. Is there any remedy in their system? I believe there is, as we have reviewed the nature of declaring us in test state without a will, and that without a will, it gives them effectively carte blanche using the statutes as the rules of administration to administer our estate in our absence and giving themselves immunity from anything that they do within reason. So, in presenting a will, we wish to rebut the presumption that we are intestate. We wish to provide a public document, a publicly recorded document, that they cannot dispute. You are the general executor. You are occupying the office of general executor of the estate of the legal person. And no more games by their people on this. I heard yesterday a judge in a matter of foreclosure still playing games when a man got up and said, I'm the general executive of the state, he said, you're the general executive. I don't understand. Still play games on this. The will will state you as the, general, as the occupant of the office of general executor. The will will make clear the rules of administration. And I hope, and certainly in the template that we present, the rules of administration will be the canons of law, astrum juris, Divini. I want to make clear that the, those rules are there. I want to make also clear the structure is there to perfect the will. So there are presumptions that we want to achieve by the uh, presentment of the will. Once we've achieved that, we still have the deeper issue. And their system has been designed as a m maximum security prison where no one escapes, so there are fail-safes. Once you rebut the presumption of the intestate, you still have the issue of living. You're living in...